I am a Zimbabwean journalist and filmmaker. I had the cruel privilege of having a front row seat witnessing my country descend into a violent village. People were beaten up and some were even murdered for simply practicing a basic human right to vote for a leader of their own choice. This film is the record of what I saw. In uh, 2008, there can be no doubt that violence has now become the only method of uh, campaigning. It's painful for my family. People who are so innocent, who don't even know what politics is all about, being brutalized. We can't rush to say, you know, the ex is the one, you know, that will change the destiny of this country. The British wants to use backdoor politics to try and recolonize Zimbabwe. And we're saying, no, that will not happen. Uh, the children's room is, is up there. Um, and they went to the door of the children's room and they were trying to terrorize the children. I was shivering. I was scared. Yes. I was also scared. We believe in ideas. But if everything comes to the extreme, our weapons will defend our ideas. It's not allowed. It's what? Is this what you're trying to do? Bring violence? Whoa, whoa. He is 85 years old and has ruled Zimbabwe since independence in 1980. And he is still determined to hold on to power. Robert Mugabe and his ruling ZANU-PF party have ruled Zimbabwe for almost 30 years. Mugabe and the ruling elite now face the mountain of problems which they had no solutions for except the use of brutal force. The Zimbabwean political landscape had changed considerably since the country's independence from British rule in 1980. Mugabe's biggest problem was the country's shattered economy. Once one of the strongest economies in Africa, it now had the highest inflation in the world. There's no money in the banks, there's no food, electricity, water, fuel. We just need a change now, we need a change. We are tired of him now. Despite all these negatives and deep popular dissatisfaction, Mugabe thought he could still win Zimbabwe's presidential race in March of 2008. <laughs> Mugabe's main political opponent, former trade unionist Morgan Changrai's message was very clear. For Changrai, change meant removing both Mugabe and his ruling ZANU-PF party from government. Morgan Changrai, like many others fighting to remove Mugabe from outside ZANU-PF, had no problem stating why Mugabe should be kicked out of power. Do you know Zimbabweans who have been so resilient? Maramba kujanyirirwa. The struggle continues. The struggle continues until final victory. The struggle continues in the township, in the villages, in the streets, everywhere in Zimbabwe. Mugabe must read the national mood. One of Mugabe's election opponents also included his former finance minister and once trusted Lieutenant Simba Makoni. Makoni, once touted as Mugabe's successor, formed a breakaway movement from ZANU-PF and ran against his boss as an independent presidential candidate. Makoni's disillusionment with Mugabe's failure to step down as party leader was part of his central message throughout his election campaign. But let me also say for those in ZANU-PF, 
that one of the difficulties we have in the party is that we have no policy, we have no strategy, we have no program, we have no commitment to renewal. Simba Makoni's presidential candidature was endorsed by the small faction of the Movement for Democratic Change. In 2005, the main opposition MDC party had broken up and the small breakaway faction was led by robotics professor Atam Tambara. Our political party has decided in pursuit of the national interest to endorse the presidential bid in Zimbabwe by Dr. Simba Makoni. The battle lines were very clear for the protagonists. For Mugabe, land and Britain were the main election issues. Mugabe's rallies around the country were history lectures of Zimbabwe's struggle. Jesu, we created democracy because we fought for one man, one vote here. England, at, at no interest in coming to England. He can keep his England and let me keep my Zimbabwe. So let them keep out of our country. What do they want here? In MDC, it's treasonous. Kuramba mchich, patsirama ma British. Morgan Changrai clearly put Zimbabwe's economic and social demise squarely on Mugabe's door. As a country, we face a generational transition. Vanavesa, Aruma, below 35, they are crying out for help. The country is in a mess. Arusuruvaro, we know we are inheriting a mess. We know this country has been left with nothing. The health delivery system had collapsed. Zimbabwe's government hospitals had not been working properly for over five years, and in 2008, they had reached breaking point. Doctors told me patients could not even get the basic medicines, like painkillers. The education system, which was once the envy of the African continent, had collapsed with teachers not turning up for work. No, the infrastructure has been dilapidated to such levels that you sometimes you teach children who are standing or they write whilst kneeling down. Transport to work was costing them more money than they were earning from their government salaries. Classrooms were now empty, and students were desperate. The absent teachers joined the more than 90% of unemployed Zimbabweans roaming the streets and spending time in long bank queues trying to get the little money they might have saved. Meanwhile, money printing machines at the central bank had no rest. They continued churning out useless Zimbabwe dollars. The central bank then exchanged the useless Zimbabwe currency for the American dollar on the black market. Most of the American dollars were coming from Zimbabweans in the diaspora who had escaped the biting economic meltdown in their country. Meanwhile, the Zimbabwean dollars couldn't buy anything because shop shelves were empty. Price controls imposed by the Zimbabwean government to tame the runaway inflation backfired as shop owners simply stopped trading to avoid running losses. Robert Mugabe and his party placed the blame elsewhere. We cannot run away from the issue, uh, issue of sanctions. They are there. They are, these are economic sanctions, not targeted sanctions. There are no lines of credit. Any American or British company that is seen to be doing business with Zimbabwe, you know, they are penalized. However, economic experts saw it differently. John Robertson is a respected Zimbabwean economist. The so-called sanctions against us now are not sanctions at all. They are decisions by the lending organizations, the World Bank, the IMF, the donor countries, not to put money into the country because we have failed to meet the requirements that would enable us to um, 
to qualify for that money. Some of the failures to qualify came from the fact that we didn't pay back the money as promised when we first borrowed it. The bank doesn't lend you money because you didn't pay back the last time they lent you money. It's not sanctions, it's simply good banking practice. One of the central issues at stake in Zimbabwe is land. Agriculture had been the bedrock of the economy in Zimbabwe before the crisis. Mugabe had taken productive land from white farmers in the name of correcting the colonial legacy in which 4,500 white farmers still owned 75% of the country's most fertile land. Up to 500 people we have employed here at one time. ZANU PF war veterans led the sometimes violent land seizures which had started in 2000 and continued right into the 2008 election time. Many white farmers were forcibly evicted and had their household goods thrown outside their homes. Sometimes the farmers confronted the looters but were powerless to do anything about it. Drive, get on that tractor and drive. Drive, we'll protect you. Go to the police station now. Start the tractor. For the police, it was too hot a political issue to handle. The rule of law had broken down. Government officials in Mugabe's home province of Mashonaland West were now using violence to evict the farmer. This Zimbabwe is for black people, not for white. Please, Mr. Kononga, take your people out the yard, please, Mr. Kononga. Is this what you're trying to do? Bring violence? Ben Frith, a British-born farmer married to a Zimbabwean farmer's daughter, was one of the first that bore the brand of the intensified land reform violence. We got a, a letter to say that we must cease all farming. Mm -hmm. uh, this was from the lands officer. Um, it's, it's just crazy. In a country where the people are starving, where we need production, that they're telling farmers who know what they're doing, who've got a long track record of very good production, but they're telling them to stop all production. It's, it's, it's unreal. Um, it's a very difficult situation that we're facing at the moment. Ben Frith's father-in-law, Mike Campbell, bought land in the 1970s when he emigrated from South Africa to the then Rhodesia. When the land reform program started, his farm was not spared either. While the Zimbabwean government was championing the cause for land reform in the country, many of the farms were going to those with powerful political connections. Ben Frith and Mike Campbell were up against ZANU-PF's information boss, Nathan Shamiharira, a political ally of Mugabe for more than 35 years. The government has offered me a farm uh, in the Chagutu area, and this was uh, Campbell's farm. If uh, he continues uh, doing what he's doing, uh, campaigning against me, I've never been to the farm, I've never uh, farmed there. The, uh, a, a stage may uh, come when uh, I will uh, take the farm. As the elections drew nearer, the problem for the ruling party was how to convince the electorate that Mugabe was the best candidate to take the country forward. 
The desperate situation energized the populace to come out in huge numbers to vote for change. This was their opportunity to speak out and be heard. This was decision time for Zimbabwe. And I need your vote. Vote Morgan. Vote MDC. Morgan Changrai's election charge was led by a team of senior party leaders, which included National Organizing Secretary Elias Mudzuri. Mudzuri was the first opposition mayor for Harare, but was removed by Mugabe under dubious circumstances. We've got answers to the problems of this country, and we are prepared to march Zimbabwe forward. On election day, March 29, 2008, the usually crowded shopping centers were deserted as people lined up to cast their votes. A vote they hoped would be respected and honored. Two days after the election, people started milling around the streets waiting for the election results. There was no presidential result coming through. ZANU PF uh, 97. MDC State television started announcing parliamentary MDC results. 10, for the first time, Robert Mugabe's ZANU PF had lost its parliamentary majority. However, the people were more anxious to know who was going to be their next president. Hey, Chueshe, these are the results. The Electoral Commission chairman, George Chueshe, a former army major, was mobbed at a local hotel by crowds of angry voters wanting to know who the next president was going to be. The commission would like to reiterate that it and it alone is the sole legitimate and authentic source of all results. Even I, as a candidate, approached them and asked, where are my votes? What are you doing with them? Please take me to where they are and show me my votes. And they wouldn't. Our country is on the precipice, on a cliff edge. And as we wait with great anxiety and apprehension, the confirmation of the people's will I have to urge the electoral authorities, that is Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, to proceed with haste. The Pan-African Parliamentary Election Observer Team was praised by the media to explain why the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission could not release the presidential results. Yeah, he said that, that place is inaccessible, and apparently they are considering sending a helicopter to get the results. This is what he said to me. <laughs> the issue is not that uh, the process was delayed. The issue is that the British government wants to get rid of President Mugabe as quickly as, as is possible. They are going to use all dirty tricks to discredit the whole process. But I can assure you, they are not going to succeed. It was now two weeks after the election and still no results. Zimbabweans were becoming more anxious and tensions were rising. Mugabe went underground to plan. There was a big problem. Mugabe may have lost the election. John Makumbe, a political science professor at the University of Zimbabwe, explains what happened next. Three times he actually made it known to his handlers that he would, uh, he wanted to hand over to Morgan, Changirai. But three times they uh, restrained him, they asked him not to, they told him they would fix things. It soon became clear how the problem would be fixed. As the demand for the election result became much louder, I met with the leader of Mugabe's War Veterans Association, Jablan Sibanda, at a local hotel in Harare. In his first and only television interview, he did not mince his words. I'm assuring you that starting from tomorrow, you'll see a different nation from what you have seen or read on the news 
about these results and everything. Where we are going ahead there, the situation will be very different. What we said to our people, they could not see with their own eyes. We are going to act as we see it fit. We are prepared to go the whole distance, the whole way, all the way. It became clear that Mugabe had come up with a new strategy. This was the site meeting villagers morning in, morning out every day. Houses bent down to the ground. The reason for building these houses is we support Morgan Changirai. We voted for Morgan Changirai. Violence was being meted out to opposition supporters living in former ZANU PF strongholds. ZANU PF and Robert Mugabe were always behind the violence. They are always behind the violence. Political violence in Zimbabwe is largely sponsored by uh, Robert Mugabe and ZANU PF. One person who has fought the perpetrators of violence in Zimbabwean courts is award-winning human rights lawyer Beatrice Mtetwa. Badly beaten by police herself, she has represented many Zimbabweans who have had their rights abused. The culture has taken root. It has become part of the political landscape that when there are going to be elections, there will be bloodshed of, 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 of a nature that ought not to be acceptable in any civilized community. As I went around the country, I could not miss the carnage. We are not sleeping in homes. We are just flooding out of our homes, feeling death. So I don't know what the, the international or SADC members, United Nations, just, why they don't just come and help us here in Zimbabwe? We are living under threat. The international community turned to South African President Thabo Mbeki to intervene and stop the violence taking place in Zimbabwe. But to the surprise of many people around the world, and particularly Zimbabweans, President Mbeki said there was no crisis in Zimbabwe. At this makeshift refugee camp in Mutare, I saw hundreds of displaced MDC supporters who had fled from the political violence and were begging their party for help. Their local member of parliament responded to President Mbeki's there is no crisis in Zimbabwe statement. President Mbeki, I'm not sure what dictionary is using to describe, to find the meaning of crisis. If this is not a crisis, I don't know what is crisis to him. People are being beaten every night. They are now what they are calling uh, drop-off camps where they beat people every night. However, South Africa's election representative in Harare, Ambassador Kingsley Mamabolo, broke ranks with Mbeki's official line and spoke out. What we see is that there is violence on the ground. Uh, people are being butchered and really perhaps this is an opportunity to say to the leaders of Zimbabwe, it can't be that Zimbabwe, the images you see of Zimbabwe in international media throughout the world, are these pictures of people who are battered, bruised and, uh, and butchered. The election result was finally announced and it confirmed what people had already suspected. Mugabe had lost the election, but Morgan Changrai had not won the required 51% to be declared the winner. There was to be a runoff election between Morgan Changrai and Mugabe. As the news sunk in, so did the fear of even more violence and reprisals, forcing people to flee their villages for the safety of town.
I met these people at the MDC offices in Arare, seeking refuge from the violent militias. They explained what happened. Before they could be assisted, the police raided the MDC offices in Arare and took them away, accusing them of having beaten up ZANU-PF supporters. However, the Zimbabwean High Court ordered their immediate release, but the police refused to release them immediately and kept them in custody. When they were finally released from police custody, the helpless MDC supporters, still fearing for their safety, ran to seek refuge at foreign embassies in Harare. This has happened because uh, they raided the MDC headquarters and drove people out, and they have no place to go. This was all perpetrated by the violence against people in the aftermath of the elections. The violence in this country has absolutely gone out of control. What we've seen in the, uh, in the last few weeks is well over a thousand, probably approaching 1,500 people have been uh, displaced, beaten, intimidated, moved off of their properties, their properties destroyed. The Americans are infringing the sovereignty of our country. They cannot claim to secure these people better than us. We've got every facility to look after these people in Zimbabwe. In the first place, why did they decide to come to the American embassy? They should go to Malawi embassy, Angola embassy, and other black embassy. So this has been st this is stage management. What he did not know was that days earlier, the refugees had gone to the South African embassy to plead for help. We are being threatened. They want to kill us. They want to kill the opposition as a wall. The embassy does not have uh, the kinds of facilities um, that they would be looking for. The more people were being beaten up, the less legitimacy the Robert Mugabe regime had in the eyes of the world. As the June 27th runoff approached, things were spinning out of control. The violence became brutal. The perpetrators became more desperate. Guys who, who murdered him were close to 500, and it's really puzzling why more than 500 people would come to kill one unarmed person. I really don't know where the country is going to. I came face to face with the horrors of what was happening in my country when I went around the hospitals in Harare. Some of the patients ended up saying that, look, we, whilst they were being beaten, some kind of liquid, a weed killer, was being used, uh, you know, to to pour on their buttocks when they are being beaten. The weed killer that is commonly used in uh, in the commercial agriculture areas is what is called paraquat, and that is known to 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 cause you know severe uh, extensive damage to, to to tissue, and it is very difficult for that tissue to heal. A week before the runoff. Morgan Changrai was going to have his final rally before the election behind a local hotel in Harare. ZANU-PF militias descended on the rally venue. They threatened MDC supporters with violence if they ever attempted to attend the rally. The MDC leader called a press conference at his house. We in the MDC have resolved that we will no longer participate in this violent, illegitimate slisham of an election process. It will be a very regrettable move if he decides to, to pull out 
because he would have deprived the people of Zimbabwe the democratic right to choose who they want to lead this country for the next five years. Shangri's decision to pull out left Mugabe in a one-man election and the violence did not stop. The militias now aided by soldiers started attacking key individuals in the MDC and farming community. Elias Mzuri, the former mayor of Harare and national organizing secretary of the MDC, had his 80-year-old father beaten up badly together with his whole family. My family went through serious trauma, but it's not just my family. It's also the members who had come to seek refuge with my family within Zaka district. Zaka district has, has been under siege for over a month. Mudzuri's young brother Anton was helpless to stop the violence. Yeah, really I was terrified. I thought maybe they wanted to kill me because they, uh, we had heard by rumors that they were coming one day with uh, those guns and um, here they were. So I was really terrified. The soldiers came through this uh, direction they surrounded the whole homestead. One of the uh, holes which was made by the bullet and the bullet is still inside. This, this one there, the other one is there, this one. My father, who is 80 years old, has had a bad attack on his back and he was telling me that uh, these people looted everything from the house. Oh. <laughs> The attackers beat up Anthony, his 80 year old father, his two sisters, and his two cousins and they were not the only victims of violence that night. This man was seeking refuge at the Mzuri's homestead. The militias beat him up on his back, creating this huge ax. A reminder that he was being beaten up for putting his ax on what the militias called the wrong candidate. Mzuri's cousin explains what she remembers of the attack. What do we do under these circumstances? What, how can we be helped? Well, people think Zimbabweans must help themselves. We are under siege by a government. And the most painful thing is that they are killing innocent family members. And they are targeting any name that relates to you as a leader, and they're also targeting you as a leader, and we don't know how far this is going to go. That violence is emanating from the MDC, and that violence is sponsored by the British government. It's part of a campaign and change strategy. The, the, the age group, you know, ranged from, uh, from, from infancy to the very old, and there are a couple of children, you know, you know, one child, you know, who sticks out is a three-year-old uh, little boy who had uh, 
uh, his eye, you know, injured by a catapult shot. One wonders why one would aim at a child of that age, uh, because uh, for whatever reason, a child of that age doesn't influence the, the, the election results in any way. 27 June, the day of the one-man election. As expected, Robert Mugabe won the one-man election and was crowned the next president of Zimbabwe. Meanwhile, in the farming area of Chegutu, 120 kilometers west of Harare, battles over land continued to be settled with violence. Yeah. Farmer Mike Campbell was accused of embarrassing the Zimbabwean government by taking it to a regional tribunal court over the land reform program. Uh, Campbell is, uh, 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 has been campaigning against the Zimbabwe government, against the Zimbabwe people uh, for a long time. Uh, and he has been working very hard to discredit uh, the, uh, the government. He has uh, taken um, the, government, the government to court, uh, to both the High Court and the Supreme Court, and he has uh, uh, campaigned worldwide against, uh, um, against us. A day after the runoff election, Campbell and his wife, Angela, together with their son-in-law, Ben Frith, were beaten up and left for dead. Well, we got a message that um, Frank Trott on Twyford Farm had been badly beaten up by Gilbert Moyo and his gang, and that they were coming on to us afterwards. So I drove after drove to my father-in-law and mother-in-law in the next door house to let them know. And as I arrived, these chaps had arrived just before me and uh, they pointed a weapon at me as I, as I drove in through the drive and uh, shot straight through my windscreen. I managed to duck, so they didn't actually manage to shoot me in the head. Um, but they then dragged me out of the vehicle and took my jersey off, tied me up with ropes, started beating me with a rifle butt over my head and back and everything. There were shots going off all over the place. They eventually bundled us up into the back of uh, my parents-in-law's vehicle. Well, I think the first thing that crossed my mind is it takes 50 of them to beat up two of us. And uh, I thought what a bunch of cowards they were. We'd just been to Sadek for this court case where we challenged the government about the farm. And uh, they did bring this up and asked us to sign a piece of paper. I couldn't write because my hand was broken, so Angela signed the piece of paper. They drove us about 40 or 50 kilometres out to their base. There were probably 50 or 60 people there, a lot of them with weapons, a lot of them were, um, you know, they were singing songs and trying to intimidate us, telling us that they were going to kill us. And my mother-in-law was just praying that they wouldn't shoot us. In fact, she was saying, you know, please shoot me rather than them. Well, soon after midnight, they decided to load us back into the vehicle and dropped off on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. We, we had no idea where we were. Unfortunately, my father-in-law and mother-in-law couldn't get up. But I managed to get up and get to a house and borrowed a phone and uh, managed to phone the family and, and get some help. The collapse of the once thriving agricultural sector due to the chaotic land reform led to food shortages.
I came across families desperate for survival. Some saying they'd gone for days without food. Half of Zimbabwe's more than 10 million people were now relying on food handouts from the United Nations and other aid agencies. The screws were turning on Robert Mugabe, and he could not continue pretending that it was business as usual anymore. The situation in hospitals was also becoming dire. I visited Harare Hospital, the biggest hospital in the country and one that caters for the poorest of the poor. What I saw inside the hospital was heartbreaking. The doctor who took me around did nothing but a notebook and a pen. She said that the hospital pharmacy was empty. As I turned my back on this ward, a woman whom I had seen sitting next to her sick husband started crying. Her husband was no more. It was painful to see people going through so much misery. Misery brought on to them by politicians. The pain being felt in the hospitals was measured by the cruelty inside Zimbabwe's jails. These are human remains of prisoners who died from easily treatable diseases due to a systematic failure by the government to provide drugs. The food crisis facing the country was even worse inside the jails. The most tragic story from these prisons was how even in death, the dead prisoners would get no respect. Their remains lay rotting in non-working cold rooms at a local hospital mortuary, which are found wide open without any security or any sense of dignity and respect for the deceased. September 15, 2008, a new dawn for Zimbabwe. Under mounting international and regional pressure, Mugabe had no choice but to sit down and sign a deal with Morgan Changrai. They called it the government of national unity. Mugabe managed to put a metal yoke and iron yoke on the whole nation of Zimbabwe. And we've worked so hard for so many years to get rid of this monster and we finally done it. Zimbabweans were to find out that this jubilation was short-lived as Robert Mugabe and ZANU PF refused to honor the spirit of the agreement. Mugabe's grip was loosened but not released and the economic situation continued to deteriorate. The government could not afford to guarantee basic things like clean water. It was broke in money and ideas. Without clean water, the inevitable happened. There was a massive outbreak of cholera. Water from the tap is too dirty. We are drinking water really dead. I think it's going waste. People are always you, they are coming you, and some people they are dying. As the cholera outbreak continued, hundreds of people were dying. But instead of attending to the health crisis, Mugabe responded to the challenges by abducting and jailing MDC activists and civic leaders. However, the economic crisis left Mugabe with no choice but to agree to finally forming a unity government five months after the original agreement was signed in September of 2008. I, Morgan Richard Changrai, do swear. Mugabe swore in Morgan Changrai, his sworn enemy, as his prime minister, and the robotics professor Atham Tambara of the breakaway MDC as the deputy prime minister.
Indeed, history has been made to him. I went to Morgan Changrai's house the night before the swearing in and was met by his extended family and friends celebrating the political breakthrough. Morgan Changrai was in no doubt of what stood ahead. This is an anxious moment for everyone, including me personally. I don't even, I don't even know what's, uh, what's going to happen. We are plunging into the unknown. Still, the use of violence and intimidation continued on the farms. Ben Frith and the Campbells were stopped from farming by the militia who were now stationed on their farm. The Campbells had been ordered out of their farmhouse by the militia. They were now staying with their daughter, Laura Frith, and her husband, Ben. May 25, 2008, Africa Day. The Fritz were having a birthday party when they realized that they had unwelcome visitors. The militia had come in full force to subject the family to what would be a 12-hour ordeal. You move! You move! Don't talk to him! Okay. They came in here and they were trying to get us out um, and then some of them went up the stairs here. Uh, the children's room is, is up there um, and they went to the door of the children's room and they were trying to terrorize the children. I was just lying in my bed and then I heard the tapping on, on the door of the, on the door. And then I looked around and I saw someone knocking at the glass. I saw these people running around, playing the drum. Everyone was making a lot of noise. Why you? You are too always in the newspaper, always in the television, always in the... You are too clever. I was shaking, shouting. I was shivering. You were shivering. And Puff was singing why, a song. Why, why were you shivering? Because of her thoughts. She was scared. Yes. If I do something too bad, don't blame me. I'm, I'm doing action against my land. They're in the kitchen. You know, I didn't know how far they were going to go, what, you know, level of violence they would use. And I was also quite afraid that they would burn the house down and I wouldn't be able to get my children all the dogs out. He's running around by the window here. A number of them kept threatening Ruth and I that they were going to rape us. So, you know, you don't know what intention they actually do have. The Fritz could not escape the ordeal as the militia had ploughed their driveway with a tractor to stop them from leaving that night. This was the site of their driveway the next morning. Yeah, you know, the adrenaline starts to pump when these guys surround you and having been through quite a number of situations now where I have been beaten up. Um, and the last occasion I was beaten up, they actually fractured my skull. Yeah, you don't know whether you're going to live or die through some of these situations. You wonder, well, am I going to get through this or, or am I not going to get through this? And there is naturally, there is naturally a lot of fear. Afraid for his family's life, Ben Frith wrote a letter to the Prime Minister Morgan Changrai, letting him know about this particular attack and the situation on the farm. Changrai responded by sending his deputy prime minister, Atham Tambara, to assess the situation on Ben Frith's farm and the other farms in the surrounding areas. We are here on a fact-finding mission. We are not here to make any decisions. We are not here to make any judgments. We are a government based on the rule of law and want to understand what is going on on the farms. We will not tolerate any government official who is promoting lawlessness in our country. Our country right now is trying to attract investment, attract trade, attract aid. We can't afford to be damaging business confidence in our country.
Although the Deputy Prime Minister was giving assurances to the farmers that they could continue farming, the armed militia was issuing its own orders to the farmers. Come through, I take you to my house. Where they've broken into. After the Deputy Prime Minister had left the farms, one of Ben's neighbors, Peter Etheridge, tried to go yeah. back to his property on the basis of what the Deputy Prime Minister had assured them. This is what happened to his workers who were okay. in the back of his trunk. When we were trying to leave, they fired shots. They, fired three. they were shot by police security guards at the farm which had been taken over by the president of the Zimbabwean Senate. And, he's, and this guy has been hit the back of the leg. We are still in the process of a revolution here, fighting the same enemy that we fought, that was fought by our forefathers in 1890. And we have not totally liberated our country. 400 kilometers away from the farm violence, Elias Mzuri's family had picked up the pieces one year after their attack. Mzuri is now Zimbabwe's energy minister in the unity government. However, his family is only too aware of what happened to them. The most painful thing that I heard my father say is that uh, they are all innocent, but they are just being victims of someone they thought he was a hero. Robert Mkabe brought them to liberty, what they thought it was independence, but this is the first betrayal they are seeing, that they are being attacked by a person they thought was a hero all his life until he started attacking his own people. We are now going to even the next generation, so those young kids that are being paraded and, 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 and are saying Zimbabwe will never be a colony again. It's basically glorifying violence, You're getting those kids to identify with the violence that we've seen being perpetrated, particularly by the armed forces. So if they are recruited into all these structures where the violence is coming from, uh, it, it, it will just be an easy passage for them, you know, from one stage to another. And the violence can only continue. Ben Frith and his family realized that it was too dangerous to continue farming with the militia still stationed on their property. The only place they had access to on the farm was their house. And the guys from St. Peter's they had won their court case at the Sadak Tribunal against the Zimbabwean government. However, Robert Mugabe and his government would not honor or respect the ruling. President Mugabe has replied that the land that is in Zimbabwe belongs to the indigenous people, belongs to the uh, African people who had it before the European colonizers came. Unfortunately, in Zimbabwe, the indigenous people who support the opposition parties were beaten up in 2008. One year on, there are still refugees living outside, landless and helpless. I feel a deep sense of the injustice that is taking place and so the courage that I've got is as a result of, of knowing that what is going on is wrong and knowing that somehow I can make a difference in the situation with God's help. The land of 
take what you want. It's a marvelous land, he said. You're allowed to wander all over it and take whatever you want for yourself without paying a penny. Everyone goes there. Oh, we, we, we have to learn trust and we have to learn faith and, and, and the kids have to learn the very same things. And, and when you're growing up, you have to learn what the important things are. <sighs> now, when you face death face to face, then you start to prioritize, well, what are the important things? You know, the important things are my family, are my friends, are uh, the things that, that mean a lot to me. Okay, shall I pray? And so, Lord Jesus, we ask you to protect us this night. We ask you to comfort us, to give us your peace. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. On August 31, 2009, it was supposed to be like any other normal Sunday for the Fritz and Campbells. They did not realize that this would be the last day they would be in their house. They came back home to a burning house, too dangerous to try and save. Their workers were equal in grief. The staff compound was burning too. The militia stood by as the properties burned down, leaving nothing to be saved. Two days later, Laura Frith was philosophical but defiant. They must come a time when this is over and I mean it has been very difficult to live in this kind of environment but you know I, I still have hope for the future and I believe that it will come right and we've, we've got to hang in there and we won't, we won't give up even now. I've got no confidence in the future at all. My faith in the African as a ruler in Africa has been shaken rigid. I don't believe that any of them are capable of ruling themselves. And democracy is just, is just a, a joke. We believe in ideas. And we believe that ideas are more worthy than weapons. And we believe that one day ideas will overcome weapons. But if everything comes to the extreme, our weapons will defend our ideas. As more and more people start to fight for justice, as more and more people start to stand up for what is right, as more and more people realize what has to be done in evil situations, we will shake off this yoke of oppression that continues to oppress all the people of Zimbabwe. Zimbabweans are so peaceful, they are only trying to say, we want change, and they are dying for that change. But I'm prepared to die. The only thing I'm prepared to die for is that anyone who follows after me will be fighting for a democratic dispensation. Our only message to the community in Zimbabwe is that um, they should fight for the future of their children. <laughs>